All right, so we're going to look at um, section three and we're going to look at experiments and observations and how we can get statistics. Um, and so what, what, you, what, what you have to first start doing is when you want to do some statistical study, you identify the variable or variables of interest. And this is called the focus of the study. And the population. Right? This wouldn't be too good, you know, looking for if you, let's say your variable interest was like favorite movies um, and you decided to choose a population of, you know, North American rock bass, right? Rock bass are not going to have a favorite movie. And so, combination of what you're measuring and the group that you're measuring it on. Then you develop a plan. For collecting data. And in this plan, you want to, are you going to use a sample? Um, and if you use a sample, make sure it represents the population. Which that becomes, you know, one of the problems is, can you get every everyone in the population? Or do you have to get a subset of the population. And if you get a subset, you got to make sure that, that, that it has characteristics that will be descriptive of the population. Then you go and collect the data. You measure, you count, you give out surveys. Once you have the data back, you describe it. Using descriptive and then you interpret the results. And you can make decisions about the population. I'll just use pop for population using inferential statistics. And find any possible errors. Because perfection is not a thing that we have. And so you find what you want to measure. And then you figure out how you're going to go and measure it. And you kind of have a combination of the thing you're measuring and the what you're measuring. Right? Then you make sure you get enough that you can talk about that with some good level of inference. And you go out and you do it. You collect the data. Once the data comes back, you're going to describe it. And that description you can use to make decisions or talk about the population fully with. And then you look to see where you could go wrong or how you could do better. And so there are some different ways we collect data. We can do an observational study. Right? Where a researcher measures, a researcher measures or observes the characteristics of interest.
And th this happens in many different ways. There's some um, efficiency experts that go in and they'll watch, you know, a factory working and they can, they'll count up the amount of time people do on different activities. And they don't ask a survey, they don't um, change anything, they just count what's happening. Um, and this is actually a common means of gathering data. The other way is called an experiment. And in an experiment, a treatment is applied to part of the population. Part of the population. You do something and that part of the population is going to be called the treatment group. The treatment group is the part of the population that you apply a treatment to. And you can, you don't always have to have, but you can have another part of the population called the control group. Which has no treatment applied. And sometimes the control group can be given a placebo which is, it looks like a treatment. But it is neutral. And the idea here is you have a before and after, right? You're hoping that treatment gives some type of result. And so you can compare the no, the treatment to the no treatment, and you can see if the treatment is beneficial. And so observational studies measure and collect data from the population uh, on samples. And experiments change, apply something, and see the effect. We also have simulations. Which use a model to reproduce conditions. And then those results are measured. In fact, that's what I do. I model um, galaxy um, gravitational dynamics, and we look at the results of those on large computers, and then we compare them to what we see and if our results are good, we know that the, the rules that we're putting into the computer match the rules um, of reality. And then in there are surveys, where you ask questions or investigate one or more characteristics of a population, one or more. Trust me, the, these words will flow more into mathematics very shortly, right? We're getting the basic definitions down. And so you, you can ask questions. You can do interviews, you can do mails. What you mail mailings <laughs> um, or online forms, right? Surveys are a way of getting information. Question design is important. In fact, one of the things you, you find in all forms of this is how you get information um, can affect what you see. And so you have to watch for what we're gonna call bias, which is when the question or method, question in a survey, or method of gathering data affects the results. Biases can sneak in many different ways. Um, just the idea of choosing something to measure really introduces a, 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 a bias. 
And so we're going to have some methods to help us um, not um, in induce biases. And now I'm going to save this page and then talk about these methods that we'll use to avoid biases. I wish there was a quicker way to do this, but we're where we need to be. And so what we want to do is we want to have in designing an experiment, we want to have a control. We want to randomize things, have some type of randomization and we want to be able to replicate, some type of replication. And these are the things that will give us a well-designed experiment. Now, a thing to watch for when we're measuring is confounding variables. And this is when you can't tell the effects of different things. And what could happen is different parameters could affect your experiment differently, um, or there might be things that you didn't measure that are affecting it. Um, the book actually gives a nice example. It says a coffee shop remodels their shop. Um, at the same time, the, a mall has a grand opening. If the business increases in the coffee shop and they're thinking it's because they remodeled, but they didn't take into account the change in traffic because the nearby mall's grand opening, um, they wouldn't be able, able to determine um, the effect of remodeling and they couldn't predict future remodeling like a, on other parts of the chain. And so when you, when you do some type of measurement, you have to be aware of things outside that, that could affect it. Um, there's only so much you can control. And, and we'll, we'll um, get into it, um, into the different controls that we can have. A very particular confounding variable is the placebo effect, which is when a subject reacts favorably to a treatment. Um, even, even if it's a placebo, and they, they think that they have, a, have the treatment. Um, they've actually found that if, if, even if they tell people they were given a placebo, there's still a part of a placebo effect that can happen. There's a lot of research in this about the ideas of how we can stimulate our own healing um, when we're doing treatments that are like medications. Um, and so to get rid of certain types of confounding variables, especially the placebo effect, we can use blinding which is two pills are given out. One is, and I'm gonna use medicine as the example. And so one is the regular treatment and one is the placebo, shade in the regular treatment. But the doctor doesn't know which is which. And that's kept, kept controlled away from the people administering it. So the patients do not know if they're getting a placebo or um, or regular med medication. Um, double blinding. Right, so in blinding, the patient does not know. And in double blinding, the experimenter and the patient don't, do not know if they're getting a placebo or not. Now, of course, this has to be done with careful record keeping. And so th this can help get confounding variables and it can keep our biases from introducing in, into any um, research that we do. You will find just the act of looking or measuring at something is a bias. What you choose to measure is a bias. And how we interpret our results have biases in them. And so we want to minimize bias. We want to get it so that the data we have is as pure as we can get it. One of the things we do for that is randomization. 
And we'll find as we get more and more into it, randomization is kind of the key here. Because if things happen randomly, then in the patterns we see will, will, will be true of the processes. And so in randomization for treatments, you randomly assign subjects to treatment groups. Now, completely random is each subject is randomly put into a treatment group. Now, there are some positives to this. That it, it means that there's no bias introduced, but it can also sometimes um, obscure confounding variables. And so to another type that's not completely random is randomized block design. And so we're having ways that we're going to design our experiments and we're going to look at information. And if we do it completely random, you know, I might pick things where there's some other factor coming into play. Let's say age is a factor. Um, but I completely ran randomly choose people, and so the ages are all smeared out, and I don't see age being a factor. Well, randomized block design, you put people with similar characteristics. I keep spelling similar wrong today. I apologize to the, for that. Similar characteristics. Into blocks. And then you randomly um, give treatment within a block. That way, if age is a factor, let's say age is your block, you have everyone in a certain age group, 18 to 26, 26 to 35, and you random treatment in here, and if age is a factor, you'll be able to see it because of the block. And so, inside the block, you get a control and a treatment. So, randomization is great um, for getting rid of bias, but sometimes certain characteristics are needed to be observed. And so randomized block design does that. Now granted, there will be a bias in where we choose our age boundaries or where we choose our characteristic boundaries. Another um, sample method for designing an experiment to get rid of bias is called match pairs. And subjects are paired. And we'll see when we do um, sampling methods, what's nice um, is if you have a pair, where the characteristics are generally the same between them. Then in one gets the treatment, and one is the control. And so you pair up subjects as close as possible. For example, you know, male um, 18 through 22 is paired with another male 18 through 22, female 18 through 22, and so on, and all these pairs create very, very similar um, structures, and then so you can split them and compare them. Now, in designing any experiment, our key factor is going to be sample size. Right? The size of the sample determines how well the data reflects the population. And what we're going to hear to talk about a lot is the population, we're going to talk about n, which is the number thing in the, in the population. And n is going to be our sample, little n. And what we want is we want little n to be big, right? Um, in general, 30 or more. But that's going to be hard. And we'll find ways of dealing with it. And so sample size determines how well our data represents the population. Now, any experiment we design, we need to be able to replicate. We need to go back and do the same things 
And hopefully if we do the same things, we get the same results. And so the way we set it up, we need to um, be able to repeat and repeat and repeat. All right. And so this is everything we have to think about when designing an experiment. Another thing to think about here, when sample size comes into play and replication comes into play, is how we sample. All right? And I'm going to save this out and I'm going to talk about how we sample, how we grab pieces of data. I always find this last section in chapter one is the bigger one. And it takes a little more because it really talks about stuff that we're going to keep building on. And so we get the words down, but, but we'll, the words don't have as much meaning yet. And we'll, we'll flesh some of these out. And as you work on the homework, you, you'll, you'll see different things to do. One of the first things we can do is we can take a census. Right? Our first sampling technique, we can take a census. And that means we count or measure the entire population. And then we can do a sampling, which is a countermeasure of part of the population. And I hope you could appreciate, we're going to spend a lot of time with samplings because census are hard to do. And even with the best sampling, you can sometimes get sample error. And all sample error is, is let's say, you know, let's say these dots are my thing of interest. And notice I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight yellow dots and four blue dots. And I, I want to know something about this, but I'm not going to count all of them. And so I grab a sample. Now, if I grab this sample, it has a very similar ratio to the overall population, right? And so there's very little sampling error. But if I grab these six, I don't see any of the green dots. And so I, I could make a statement going, well, you know, it looks like 100% of them are yellow. And so that's really what sampling error is, is when you don't grab the whole population, there is a chance that you don't get a good picture of the whole thing. And we're going to learn the language, whoops, sorry, bumped my microphone there, um, the language where we can talk about how we measure sampling error and how we report it. And so when we do samples, um, these very much um, mimic um, experimental techniques. We can do a random sample where every member of the population has an equal chance of being included. There's no variable for membership into the experiment. And so a simple random sample, you know, everything gets the same probability of being included. You, what we can do to do random samples is, you know, we might have the whole population and, and we use a random number generator. And we say one, two, three, four, five, and we use a random number generator and we figure out we need 351, four, eight, 722, whatever the random number generator gave us, and we grab the sample or the, the member of the population that we've assigned that number to, and the randomness of the numbers go to. And so each member of the population gets assigned a number, and then we have some software program or some table that gives us a set of random numbers, and we grab number case number 351, and we use that and we pull that out and that's the sample we go. This gets us away from picking or choosing because our picking or choosing 
could put a bias in, right? And so by doing random numbers, um, that can take care of it. It also means like people that sign up early for a survey or things that are counted first. If we do a true random number generator, we'll get th as many things as the beginning in the middle or the end. And so any confounding variables that might be hidden in how things sign up or get measured um, will get taken out. Now, the book is going to walk through a table for random, random number generation. What happens is a computer will go through, um, and there's different mathematical techniques for generating random numbers, and they print tables in the back of books. And literally, you just point your finger at, at um, these, and you get a six-digit number, 71966, is the example in the book. What you do is you read the digits in groups of three. And so if I needed to get, um, let's say I had 731 students, which is the example the book uses, and I get a um, random number generator, I point to this table and I start at 71966, the next line is 27386, and five zero 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 four. And since seven thirty one is a three digit number, I grab three digits, I grab three digits, I grab three digits, and so on and so on. And this tells me I'll I get seven nineteen, I get six sixty two. Well seven thirty eight is bigger than seven thirty one, so I ignore that. I get six fifty and I get 004, the fourth one. And so these tables have a way of me generating the numbers I need. I'm just grabbing every three because I have a three-digit number that I need to grab from. And so if I need a random sample, there's these tables that do that. You're going to find in the software presentation that we do that we're going to let software grab random numbers. And so this is kind of our first mathematical foray here. We've set the field where we, well, we have statistics now. And we have statistics as the study of how we observe things. And we've got two branches of it. Descriptive and inferential. In both of these, we design an experiment. And we can either use a whole population or a sample. And what tends to happen is samples are easier to gather and describe, and we use samples to infer via inferential statistics about the overall population. And that's really the game we're going to play. But we have to do it in a way that doesn't introduce bias, where our choices don't affect what we measure. And to be honest, we can never be 100% free of bias. And so we're going to do things to minimize bias. All right, um, I'm going to stop the video here, and I'm go the next video is going to be looking at, at Excel and how we can get random numbers out of Excel, um, and, and generally how to use it as our calculator um, to help save time and effort for it.